What's up, BB? Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Tim Travels. He's just like spazzing out here. Welcome back to Tim Travels. I'm Terry, your host, coming at you from uh, Cordell, Georgia. Got a pickup near here in the morning. But I actually came up to Cordell because there's a Thermo King dealer up here and my APU is not working again. And actually it hasn't been working correctly for several months, but now the fan won't even blow. Forget about the AC. I mean, it's cooler up here, so I wouldn't need that. Um, but yeah, the, the, the engine won't even turn on. So, I, you know, my batteries don't recharge, etc. So I'm not, I like my truck, but the APU has been a pain in the butt the entire time I've had the truck. And um, it's not really worth 70 bucks a week to me. I would rather just, it's just, to me, it's just a freaking lawn furniture at this point. It's just a weight on the truck that I really, you know, because when something's not, I, when something's not reliable, then I don't want it around. Um, because it then becomes a liability, and um, I'd rather have a I'd rather have a different system, like the EPU system that I had at GP Transco, um, which is much simpler. It's basically like the truck runs the way the truck runs. It just has an extra set of batteries um, that sit between the frame rails behind and kind of a little bit underneath where the sleeper is. And then the engine on the truck just starts up periodically to charge the batteries. Now I know some people don't like that system, but it's much simpler. Um, it's a much simpler system, and you know, as long as <laughs> as long as the batteries have a charge, the engine will start to charge them more. You know, um, I just like that better. Um, and or the other option is to just have a truck that you can at least idle, you know, when you need to. Um, I, I don't run it all the time. It, you know, the outside noise doesn't necessarily bother me. Um, but I would like to be able to idle it when it's not above 80. Um, sometimes I feel like I need that. So anyway, um, I came up here to go to Thermo King and you know RA said well go, go up here it's near your 01 but the place is only open from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. I got up here at like 1630 and they're like oh you know come back in the morning but my pickup is at 1100 and you know if you ever been to a Thermo King dealer which I have multiple times they're not going to get it done in two hours unless it's some super simple thing but I don't think it is I think it's just another big issue and you know it's just painful sometimes so anyway um, <clears throat> that's that I was um to share a little bit of like business I guess history securities and exchange history so where I delivered down in Florida, right up the road, is a place called Howie in the Hills. And that's four words. <clears throat> I think it's hyphenated. Howie in the Hills, Florida. And um, so the reason that Howie in the Hills, Florida is of interest to me is because it is the place that generated a Supreme Court decision that laid out the four-part test that is to this day the standard four-part test for determining if something is an equity security. And <clears throat> this decision goes back to 1946, but basically what happened is there was this guy named W.J. Howie. And um, Howie bought, it, it, the guy was clearly kind of ahead of his time if you think about it in a way but he bought a bunch of land in central Florida and just to give you an idea it's kind of like near Leesburg kind of like east of the villages area kind of west of northwest of Orlando so he bought this area just raw land and he named it you know Howieville or something right 
But in any event, he owned all this land and he had citrus on it. So what he did was he said, okay, well, I'm gonna sell plots of half of this land to people and then I'm going to tell them that if they want to they can then lease the land to a service company and then all the profit from that citrus you know will just go to them from their share of the land right and so what happened is people bought the land they got the deed to it but then they would sign a contract with a service company that would handle the farming, if you will, of the citrus. And they were told they didn't have to use his company, which was called Howie in the Hills Service Company. Um, but, you know, their, his company was the best position to maximize their, their investment, right? And so, the Securities and Exchange Commission found out about this and they said, hey, that's a security and under the Securities Act of 1933, um, you have to provide people with investment information, a prospectus essentially. And you know, Howie was like, no, that's not a security. I, I sold some land and then people contracted with somebody to you know basically handle the property for them but the problem that howie had was it was all sold as like an investment right because when, once you signed that service contract you had no say over anything you couldn't even go on the land right so it was like you basically signed this over so court ends up you know the case ends up going to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court laid out a four-part test um, and I'm not going to get into that test but it was a really really huge seminal decision and like I said this the, the decision was handed down in 1946 and if you're wondering I said that this was the decision that laid out the four-part test for equity securities and that is true because there was another decision that's also seminal, but it laid out the test for debt securities or bonds, in other words. So how to identify if, if there's a loan being made, right, that's debt, but certain kinds of loans can end up being securities and fall under much more stringent regulations. So anyway, that's a little history going back to uh, well, going back to the 40s when the Howey test was promulgated. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the what's going on with the railroads and you know how it impacts trucking, but, all, but maybe more importantly, how it impacts being just a blue collar worker. So if you follow my channel for a while, you know I'm kind of I'm, I'm, pro, I'm definitely pro worker. I don't like seeing workers get screwed, but I also, I also recognize what it means to run a business and how the, you know, how the law factors into all of that. But what's happening now, and, and just to give you a little background, railroad workers blue collar workers union workers and they belong to several different unions it's not just one right there's the uh there's the union that represents trainmen right or in other words engineers conductors and anybody that would uh, ride a train and then there's another union that represents maintenance of way employees now those are the two biggest unions and really, other than those two unions and the signalmen, right, those are the people that really just get the trains going down the tracks, right? So maintenance away, they maintain all the rails, switches, roadbed, ties, all that stuff. Signalmen handle signals, right? You see railroad signals if you go by railroad tracks and crossing gates, stuff like that. Now, 
Um, but there's also maintenance way guys work on that. And then of course there's the engineers and conductors. And then there are separate unions for people that do, you know, car repair, uh, you know, locomotive repair, um, both electricians, mechanics. But anyway, you know, the two biggest unions, the maintenance way and the, um, I think it's called Blet, the boilers, locomotive men, engineers, trainmen. It's like an old title. But, um, and going back to when locomotives were steam locomotives, they rejected the contract. Now, what happened was there was, there was no contract and they, they had been in negotiations for years, because I think it's been well over two years since the contract expired. Well, then the, there was a presidential emergency board appointed and they negotiated a deal and it does give big pay raises to all of the railroad employees however the issue has been not so much pay but the ability to take a day off when you need one and if you don't understand how railroads work and some trucking companies actually work like this they have what is called an extra board and unless you have a butt ton of seniority and you're on a set um, run, like maybe dedicated account in trucking, you you work off the extra board. And what happens is they just call you and say, you got two hours to report to whatever your um, terminal is, for lack of a better term. And then if you need to be transported to a different location to get on a train, or you know, then, then they just drive you there. But you you have two hours to report for duty, and this is constant, right? So like, even when you go home, you're still subject to a two-hour recall. Now you have certain rest periods, but once you're out of that rest period, and I I think it is ten hours, then you're subject to recall. So it's not like you can just be like, oh, let's go away this weekend right because you could be you could be called in at any time it could be the middle of the Super Bowl it could be the middle of the night it could be any holiday you know they could call you at, at 8 o'clock on Christmas morning and be like be to work by 10 you and you never know when you're gonna get called there's no there's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of certainty because if there's if something happens a hundred miles away you know and trains can't run then you won't get called for quite a while but it could be that trains got stacked up in some other division and they're finally showing up in your division and like the second you get your 10 hours they're calling you um, and I'm not sure if they can call you before your 10 hours ends but you know where the where you would meet your 10 hour requirement but anyway, it's it's a it's a tough lifestyle, and the issue is that let's say that you're sick, right? Right now, if you call out, you don't get paid, and you know all that all that this all that these contract rejections are about are basically having some paid sick days per year, like the the. The union members want seven per year. Now, <clears throat> Congress is gonna probably, and I think I just did see something that the bill got through the Senate, and, and what happens is once that presidential emergency board solution is rejected, then Congress can step in and basically ratify something and force that contract on the railroad employees. And you say, well, how is that legal? And the answer is because years and years of law and precedent, because the railroads have been seen, and probably rightly so, for you know at least 150 years as this as something that is <clears throat> so essential to the U.S. economy, to U.S. national security that they have a special set of rules. That's also why they have railroad retirement. So but there are a couple of governing bodies over the railroads, the Federal Railway, 
Federal Railway Administration, the FRA, and they're the ones that determine, you know, hours of service and, and a lot of stuff. But then there's also the Surface Transportation Board, which determines like mergers and, you know, what railroads, big things. Um, and also service failures. So like when the railroads are not doing their job well enough and customers complain, the STB, the Surface Transportation Board, will actually call in like the CEOs of these companies and be like, how come you guys are dropping the ball? Well, what's been going on is that for the past few years, the railroads have been cutting personnel or, or probably more accurately not hiring personnel, although they do furlough. And, you know, all of this, all of this is governed by rules that have been around for decades. And I got a kind of a problem with what's going on because, you know, I don't think what these folks are asking for is really too much to ask for, you know, some sick days. But Congress is like, oh, well, and, and President Biden, who is supposedly pro-labor, is, is more worried about the economy because all these people that are not pro-labor, like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and all these trade groups, are like, oh, it's going to cost the economy $2 billion a day, blah, blah, blah. It's going to shut things down, supply chain disruption. You know, this is how food gets on the table. It's, and a lot of it's hyperbole. A lot of it is true, but $2 billion a day sounds like a lot. But if you understand how big the U.S. economy is, um, you know, it's not. But here's the problem, right? We have a group of people, and I would call them elite, because there's not a lot of them who work on railroads. and. I, and I want to, and what I'm about to say, I want to talk about all of the railroads in North America. So really, in, in the United States, there are five class one railroads, okay? And just to review, those five class one railroads, and there are other railroads that are regional, that are short line, but I'm just talking about the biggest five, right? So CSX, Norfolk Southern, basically run the eastern half of the United States. Then Kansas City Southern, which runs the central part of the United States, and then Union Pacific and BNSF, right? They run the West, right? Chicago, Memphis, and West, right? And the railroads all overlap. And that's how stuff can get from Maine to San Diego, let's say. Now, I also include in this the two large Canadian railroads, Canadian National and Canadian Pacific, and by the way, CP has a merger going on that's been approved by the Surface Transportation Board to merge with Kansas City Southern. And then, so those two, and then the big Mexican operation called Ferromex. And you may have seen some of their local, you know, you see, you see a train going by and there are locomotives from all sorts of different companies, but you'll see, if you look for them, you'll see Ferromex coming and going. And you'll see Ferromex locomotives all over the country because of how locomotive sharing works between all the railroads. So I want to talk about all eight of the North American railroads, the big ones. And so, you know, the U.S. union members don't have benefits as good as Canadian railroads, um, guys that live in Canada, people who live in Canada. And I just think we ought to just standardize that. But the other thing is, and, and by the way, I say this as a stockholder, I own stock in Union Pacific Corporation, okay? Um, and so I wanna be, you know, upfront, just like Jim Cramer would be. Um, <clears throat> but I really think the time has come to make railroads not-for-profit companies and <clears throat> you say wait a minute Terry you're not a capitalist <clears throat> you want to turn the railroads into uh, charities and the answer is no I don't want to turn it into a charity a charity is also a not-for-profit company that's how they're structured but charities have a charitable purpose right they give stuff away um, or in the case of churches they just hoard money and pay like their pastors and their bishops and stuff, you know, 
to live lavishly, but don't get me started on that tax break. But anyway, um, the reason I say not-for-profit companies is this. Because we, we acknowledge that railroads are so important and we need these workers, you know, a lot of the reason that workers on railroads are just overburdened is because the railroads haven't hired anybody. Why haven't they hired anybody? Because they thought they could run the railroads with less people, right, um, than they previously had. That's why there have been tons of service failures. But the other thing, and even this, the head of the STB recently said, well, you, you know, you guys are talking about this strike like it's going to be some big service failure, but you've cut 10% of your personnel anyway. There's been a 10% service cut anyway. And so what I'm saying is don't, you know, don't have a profit motive. Don't be trying to make people like me and Warren Buffett, who owns all of basically BNSF, don't try to make us happy, right? Take us out of the equation. And hire everybody you need, charge what you need, but make, but when you have a not-for-profit, right, the, the, the whole reason for the company to exist is just for the company to exist, right? Like, you don't have to have a profit. You know, you want to make money, but you only want to make money to continue to survive and thrive. And if the railroads were a public kind of trust, and keep in mind, you know, you say, well, what about all the work they've done? These these big people, the Harrimans of the world, you know, built this thing up and Leland Stanford and all these people up back in the day. And here's the thing to keep in mind. The railroads, especially the railroads out west, were they they were given given billions or maybe hundreds of millions of acres of land basically for free. A lot of it was land that was taken from people like native tribes. Um, and railroads have always had been treated special. You know, if you go back, there's, there's dozens of court cases and, and railroads have almost never lost court cases because they were seen as this important thing for the economy and we couldn't, we could not hamstring them. We could not make it tough on them. But here, but we've come to this inflection point where we need to increase the amount of cargo that railroads can control. By the way, I'm, I'm gonna change my glasses since the sun is setting. Um, and we need to, and we need to always have the railroads hitting on all cylinders, pun intended, right? So what if we said, look, you guys don't have to turn a profit. You can still pay people, you know, you can still pay the CEO three million bucks, right? It's a big job or whatever they, they make. But that's what they get. You can have good retirement plans for everybody and basically let them be a, a private, entity that's treated like the government like so that instead of having 401ks they have 403bs and there's big contributions made to them and take the profit motive out of it so that the railroads will hire let's say everybody we need and we'll let workers take sick days or go to the doctor because here's the thing this contract is gonna get shoved down the throats of all those people who voted against it, okay? And what's ultimately gonna happen is that people honestly are gonna to get to the point where, and by the way, let me just digress slightly. People will quit the railroad before they'll quit other things because unlike a place that maybe has a traditional pension like a police department or a, a city water department or you know a fire department quitting the railroad doesn't mean you lose that railroad retirement because railroad retirement is part of it's contributed by the employee at the time of service just like social security and, it, and it's basically like a a social security system on steroids 
and then part of it's contributed by the company. But for instance, my father worked, I think, on five different railroads in his lifetime. He never retired from any of them, but he got railroad retirement when he was in his 60s, 70s, and 80s, right? Because it, it basically, there's no vesting. Once, if you work on the railroad for one paycheck, you, you got some railroad retirement. Now, I might be a little bit ridiculous there. There might be some minimum amount of time. But my point is, my dad worked on railroads all over the country. Like, he worked in Alaska and Florida. That's how far flung it was. He worked for the Alaska Railroad. He worked for the Florida East Coast Railroad. He worked for the Erie Railroad. He worked for a short line called the Ontario Midland. Um, and I think there's one other that he worked for that I'm missing. But anyway... Um, anyway, he, so, oh, I mean, he worked on a railroad construction company. That's, he worked for a company called Loram that's still around. They're a big Canadian company, but that was railroad retirement too. Um, and so anyway, what if we just treated the railroads kind of like the military? We let them run their own thing. They got their own budget. They make their own money. They charge their own rates, but then the U.S. economy isn't going to be held hostage, and, and I don't want to use that in a negative way, but the U.S. economy isn't at risk because the railroads don't treat their workers well enough. Because if we take the profit motive away, we take guys like me out of the picture, guys like me and Warren Buffett, and I'm going to talk to Warren after this uploads. You know, the railroads become this Thing that serves the public and just tries to exist and there's incentive to lay more track there's incentive to work harder there's you know all of these incentives because and the incentive is you keep your job you get a retirement you have all these benefits right a lot of people like working on the railroad but they just don't like dealing with the railroad um, and then it, it serves customers better right all these agricultural concerns, um, you know, people that need to ship wheat and corn and soybeans get better service because there's more train crews, there's more trains. Um, so anyway, I mean, I know it's kind of pie in the sky, but I like to think about things like this. And, you know, I think part of the problem in America these days is so many people don't have big ideas and if they do, they don't want to try to implement them. You know, what built this country was big ideas. And there's a lot of people in, in government and politics and so-called captains of industry. They don't have big ideas. They have, sometimes they have profitable ideas, but they don't have big ideas that really, uh, you know, make our country, you know, what it, what it has been. You know, whether it's, you know, like I, I look at things that are that, that were built years ago, like the interstate highway system or something, or bridges, tunnels, you know, like there's just a lot of people that are short sighted. Like, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure that if let's say there were no railroads today and somebody was like, well, you know, if you lay you know, tens of thousands of miles of track and put these locomotives and cars out there, your economy will just explode. It'll just go through the roof. I'm not sure anybody would do it. I'm not sure there's any company that would do it. I'm not sure the government, you know, I think there'd be all this fighting. And I think when something did get done, you'd have a governor in one state who's a Republican and a governor in the other state who's a Democrat. And they'd have different gauge tracks or like the the tracks would come together like this, you know, and nothing would get done. So anyway, that's my little rant. Um, but I think there are a lot of industries that could go to a not-for-profit model. They could survive and be great places to work when you take the profit motive away. And by the way, I got the idea for this a while ago from the, the Salt Lake Tribune newspaper. They decided to go to a not-for-profit model to survive, basically, right? Because advertising dollars were dropping off and stuff like that. And, you know, they went that way to survive. 
Um, I don't think the railroads are in danger of not surviving, but I think that their ability to serve the public good um, is, is, you know, is less than it used to be, you know? So anyway, uh, love to hear comments, concerns, uh, and I love to have, uh, I love all our subscribers. And um, yeah, so, and by the way, you know, I, I, there's not gonna be a railroad strike. We already know that, um, you know, and I think, I, I'm not sure it would impact me as a trucker that much. Um, some industries, maybe. Guys that haul, you know, drive those Timpty hoppers, they probably get more work just moving grain around. But, um, you know, I think it's gonna be resolved. Uh, fuel prices look like they're coming down. Uh, the Fed has said they're not, they're gonna ease off on interest rate hikes. So I don't know that there's gonna be, you know, like a recession. Um, you know, I think things are gonna be okay. But I'm an optimist. So anyway, talk to you soon. Bye.